coming up. A full report on the Saints spanking of the Bears. We'll talk to guards Steve Trapillo and Derek Kennard as they return from injury. We'll hear a reaction from the winners in the NFL antitrust suit. And we'll go fishing with special teams coach Joe Marciano. Oh, come on now. Don't look so sad. Saints Sideline is next. Saints Sideline. Brought to you by Midas. Nobody beats Midas. Nobody. Your local Isuzu dealers. Budweiser. Nothing beats Saints football and nothing beats a Bud. And by Lennox. It must be a Lennox. This is an exclusive presentation of WGNO Sports. Alexander Laurent. Saint Sideline. Hello and thank you for joining us on Saint Sideline. I'm Alexander Laurent. And I'm Ed Daniels. Ed, the Bear Jinx is over. Chicago beat the Saints twice in 1991, but thanks to an awesome second half performance, the Saints ran away from the Bears. Ran away from them big time in the second half. Big plays. Again, the difference, Alex, the Saints didn't have enough of them offensively last week in Philadelphia. This week, they came in droves. The Saints got four big scoring plays, two from that offense and two from the defense, all in the second half as they turned it into a route, beating the Bears 28 to 6. Saints offensive coordinator Carl Smith didn't make the faithful mad. Instead, he was the mad scientist. Five times the Saints threw long, hitting three. Off the fake reverse, Bobby A. Bear to Eric Martin for 52 yards and a 7-6 third quarter lead. A. Bear threw 44 yards to Quinn Early. And the play that finished off Chicago, a 72-yarder to Wesley Carroll on the second play of the fourth quarter. They've got aggressive safeties, and uh, uh, they had been on pretty much everything in the first half. So uh, we were going to try some hard play fake and, uh, and uh, see how they reacted. It was plays that were designed to go certain places, and certain people were supposed to do certain things to get the safety and the bind to either go to one side or the other, and the quarterback would go the opposite way. The Bears were determined to tightly cover Saints receivers. They paid the price. All part of football. You throw short, you throw deep, son. <laughs> the Saints also tried the halfback pass, but Dalton Hilliard was forced to run and did for a first down. For a club with a label as ultra-conservative, we can only wonder if this was a one-time thing or the wave of the future. You bet. We're going deep. <laughs> <laughs> Chicago sports writers were praising the Saints' big play offense. Here's what they're saying. A headline in the Chicago Tribune said it all. Bears secondary picked apart. Bobby Aber also drew rave reviews. Bob Verde writes, Aber didn't need the French Quarter for uninterrupted fun. Only the third and fourth. He read the Bears secondary quicker than a menu, and the feast was on. And Don Pearson added, Bobby Aber beat the Bears Sunday because he got slightly better protection than Jim Harbaugh, maybe because of the crowd noise. And he summed up the early season matchup by writing, both teams realize they have to make more big plays more often to be taken seriously in January. As of Sunday, the Saints have a head start. For Bobby Bear, the Bears game was his second victory of the week. The first came in a Minneapolis courtroom as verdict number one in the NFL antitrust suit went to the players. Showtime, baby, showtime! A 12-person jury struck down the NFL's Plan B free agency system. Woo! The players say, we won big. The owners say only Plan B may be effective. My wife was wondering why I was giving high fives to myself in, in our kitchen, but uh, it, it was exciting because it's something that we deserve, you know. All we're asking for is, is just freedom, the freedom to work in what we were like, and, and that's the basic issue. This, is, this wasn't big, you know. I figured we'd win this thing. Saints management was mum on the verdict, but Bobby Bear wasn't. He sat out the 1990 season contending he was a free agent. His court case comes up soon in Philadelphia. People not really understanding the whole issue, saying, um, you know, you lost uh, a million dollars or a million plus, whatever, you'll never make that up. They just didn't know the real deal. And, um, you know, I don't feel like I have to defend myself, but 
I'm going to have an opportunity probably be in a position to have maybe four or five, six times more than I ever could have made that year. So if that's bad advice, I'll take it. Who won in court? Who lost? It depends on your perspective. But one thing's for sure, when some form of free agency does arrive, Bobby Bear will be there to take advantage of it. The team uh, mates of mine have been joking with me, you know, calling me the Cajun lawyer and stuff. And, you know, you see on Saturday Night Live, caveman lawyer, you know. You go, here we got, here we got the Cajun lawyer. Bear is in the final year of a two-year, $2.73 million contract. If the players and owners somehow hammer out a new collective bargaining agreement, Bobby Bear could really be a free man this offseason. Coming up next, Saintly Causes. We'll get an update on a few charitable events. And we'll take to the scenes with Coach Joe Marciano. Stick around for more of Saints Sideline. preseason game in Baltimore, the Red Cross raised $370,000 for hurricane relief in Florida and Louisiana. While that money helped, the Red Cross is still several million dollars away from its goal. So this past week, the Saints jumped back in to help. Tom Benson and the Saints have donated $100,000 to the American Red Cross Relief Fund for Louisiana victims of Hurricane Andrew. What Mr. Benson and the Saints is doing today is just evident of that, that spirit. The Saints organization is so wonderful, not only for New Orleans, but for the entire state of Louisiana. And, and them making this first step, I am very proud to be here and thank them, would like to thank them personally. In other charity news, the Musi Conti in the French Quarter is teaming up with the Saints to raise money for United Cerebral Palsy. For every adult ticket purchased with the Saints ticket stub, or a note saying, I'm a hoot at, the museum will deduct a dollar from the admission and match that deduction with a dollar donation to UCP. My daughter uh, uh, has cerebral palsy, and uh, now she's 33 years old. You know, she's been through high school, got her diploma, went to junior college, got her diploma there. And, you know, it was just the, the attitude she's always taken and the things that she's done, it's like she's just going to live a normal life. And, and, you know, she really pumped me up when I thought things were going bad and I threw four, three or four interceptions. You know, I'd always think about her. And... The Saints Hall of Famer was at the museum to help raise money for the local UCP Foundation. Pat Swilling is the current UCP player spokesman. Number 56 will donate money for every sack he makes in 1992. And finally, some saintly wives are teaming with the Multiple Sclerosis Society for the MS Tour for Cure bike ride. It's not a race, first of all, so you can go at your own speed, which I think is nice for people to know. And uh, you start out from uh, Hammond, and you ride through a beautiful countryside. It's, it's slightly hilly in places, but mostly flat. And they have uh, stopping stations for you about every 10 or 12 miles, where they have uh, refreshments and food, and then you have a lunch stop. It's very social. I met lots of neat people. You know, you're just riding along. Somebody comes up and rides beside you, and you talk to them, and uh, you just keep on going and enjoying the countryside. 1,200 riders are expected to make the 150-mile ride. It gets started on October 3rd. Besides being the Saints special teams coach, Joe Marciano is a fishing pro, too, on the staff of a national boat manufacturer. As Don Dubuque shows us, when he's not on the field coaching football, he's in a boat teaching the art of fishing. From Texas, New York, even Hawaii, they came to Cocodry, about an hour southwest of New Orleans. Saints and other NFL players, coaches, and sports writers gathered at the invitation of Coach Joe Marciano for a day of Louisiana saltwater fishing. Uh, hey, give me five, Tony. <laughs> give me high five. Give me double high. Give me double high. There you go. Now, you can take the coach out of competition, but you can't take the competition out of the coach. We got potential big fish on the line right here. 22 guys, 10 bucks a piece. Pocket chain. Marciano, nursing a back injury, proved he's always willing to go the extra mile to help a teammate win. In this case, Louisiana Sportsman Magazine editor Ann Taylor. 
We got poundage. Give it up, man. Give it up. Give it up. Right. Despite setbacks and frustrations, no, no, get the hell out of here with that camera, buddy. He remained the eternal optimist and taunted the opponents. And the best ones are coming up, and we didn't put our fish in there yet now. Former Viking Ed Marinero wasn't sure what he'd caught. What'd you catch today? Some sort of fish. I'm, uh, I'm not a real fisherman, so we, we caught some uh, uh, big fish, just big, slimy fish. It was, uh, it was fun. Or what he caught it with. Just like these things that moved. Uh, they were very effective, though. Coco Marina owner Johnny Glover was impressed with the catch. I tell you what, they must have had a workout because they have uh, a lot of nice reds, uh, beautiful catch of reds. And, and matter of fact, they caught a lemon fish without even trying. So that's not bad. They had a good catch, beautiful catch. Johnny Glover here at uh, Coco Marine been awfully good to the Saints, and, and uh, we just brought guys from literally all over the country for a little camaraderie and catch some fish. For Saints Sideline, I'm Don DeBue. Coming up next, more from Sunday's big win over the Chicago Bears. And two key members of the offensive line made the regular season return to the Superdome. We'll go man-to-man -man with Steve Trapillo and Derek Kennard when Saints sideline continues for Steve Trapillo and Derek Kennard. Both men set out the season with injuries, but after a year of rehabilitation, both men are back. Steve Trapillo's knee injury kept him away from the game for all of last season. But with surgery and a year-long rehabilitation, Trap has recovered, and he's very anxious. I want to get out there and play more than I ever have, you know. You don't lose the fight. I think if anything, you can gain a little more, and, and you know, you just want to get out there. I know I, sometimes I do a lot of things that, uh, you know, I might do things, try too hard sometimes, which ends up hurting me. But you just want to get back out there and play, you know. Steve Trapillo is... Uh the kind of guy that gets really fired up about playing football. And what happens is when you get a guy like that and he plays over a course of four years and then he gets injured, um, that thing just eats at him. And it's been eating at him for a year and a half, basically, since he's been out of football. But he had his chance to come back and he had a chance to, uh, uh, you know, get mix it up and, and he's come along real well. I was never the greatest athlete. I'm just one of them guys who works real hard all the time and just, you know, I keep fighting after you and fighting after you and fighting after you. And, and you know, that's, that's the kind of player I've been in the past, and that's what I'm trying to get back to. When Trapp's injuries sidelined him for the season, the Saints had a big pair of shoes to fill, and they filled them with Derek Kennard, a 6'3", 300-pound freight train. But Kennard's season came to an abrupt end when during a weightlifting session, he tore his right pectoral muscle. And that required surgery and rehabilitation. And now he's ready. What kind of player are you once you get on the field? How do you change? Obviously, you're not the same guy when you're out buying groceries, but... I get a little feisty, I guess. You know, I'm out there, I'm out there hustling, trying to help our, help our team. But, uh, you know, also, I don't like, uh, I like those guys, those... Those little piss hands screws jumping on my jumping on my running backs. We gotta keep those guys off of them. So I'm out there. So I'm out there scrapping and help those guys out too. He gets a little feisty buying groceries too. Don't want to Derek Kennard and Steve Trapillo both have defensive temperaments and mentalities. You know, they like to mix it up. They just don't want to block you. They want to knock you down. And uh, you know that's that's both both their their attitudes when they go out on the football field. Most important thing is we're, we're back. Canard and Trapillo split time at right guard Sunday against the Bears. On the other side of the ball, it was a dream game for defensive lineman Robert Pig Goff. 3:29 left to play. Ricky Jackson nails Jim Harbaugh. Pig Goff picks it up and runs 19 yards for a 21-6 Saint lead. As Goff hits pay dirt, he gives it the mega spike, something Pig does every time he scores a touchdown. Pig, have you ever scored before? No, sir. No, <laughs> sir. <laughs> Never scored before. That was my first. Just seeing the ball is a great feeling. Knowing you got a chance to cover a farmer is a great feeling. But the ball had a little bounce on it and hit, hit me right in my hands. It started to the races. Goff kept the football asking teammate Kevin Haverdink to hold on to it. 
Alex, the Saints defense has picked it up where it left it off last year. In two games now, they've given up a total of 21 points against two pretty good offensive clubs, Philadelphia and Chicago. And they've been especially good causing turnovers. Two interceptions, a fumble recovery Sunday. That makes seven takeaways in two games. If the Saints can keep up this pace, they'll win a lot of games this year. Coming up next, we'll go back to 1975 to the Saints' first ever victory in the Superdome. For all GTX oil change at Rapid Oil Change. Revenge was a key word Sunday. The Bears had beaten the Saints twice in 1991. Once in the playoffs, when the Saints fans and Alex were pelted with snowballs, and once to end a seven-game winning streak. For all of New Orleans, pounding the Bears was certainly a very nice feeling. The Bears knocked New Orleans out of the 90 playoffs, stripped the Saints of their unbeaten tag in 91. It was payback time, a theme even the head coach touched on this week. Coach speaking that all week, you know, that these guys have hurt us the last two big games we played. So I think everybody kind of picked it up a notch in that fourth quarter and tried to get these guys back like we did. The physical Bears did end Floyd Turner's year in the second quarter. Floyd broke his uh, thigh bone. He'll, uh, he's in the hospital, and uh, obviously he'll he'll be done for the season. Probably what they do is they, they operate and put a pin in there, and which I guess facilitates the healing. And, but he'll, you know, he'll be done. It was a clean hit in a tough game. For once, when Jim Mora waved to Mike Ditka, he could do it with a smile. The Saints had put the hurt on the Bears, and it was about time. Sunday's win marked the Saints' 60th in the Superdome. The first came on a memorable afternoon back in 1975, as we see in this week's great game in Saints history. 1975 was the first year the Saints played in the brand new Superdome. But four games into the season, the Saints had yet to win a game. That is, until the Green Bay Packers came to town. The Packers opened up a 16 to nothing lead, but that's when the Saints began marching back. First, Archie Manning hits Joel Parker for the score, and it was 16 to seven. Then, Gil Chapman, the second leading punt returner in team history, breaks loose on the long one. This set up another score as the Saints pulled to within two points of the Packers. And the defense began putting on the hits. First, number 37, Tommy Myers. Then, number 54, Rick Middleton. And finally, number 58, Joe Fittersfield. All combined to shut down Green Bay and set up the drive. Less than two minutes to go, Archie Manning throws downfield for number 83, Don Herman. Herman's catch got the Saints close. And in the final seconds, Rich Zaro booted through the game winner as the Saints pulled out a thriller for their first win in the Superdome. The final was Saints 20 and the Packers 19. Now go guys. Coming up next, we'll preview the Saints' first ever trip to the Georgia Dome. by Barry Manufacturing, America's best men's clothing value. This week's Saints-Falcons game at the Georgia Dome in Atlanta doesn't need any hype. In their last two meetings, a New Orleans native has absolutely killed the Saints. On November 24th, the Saints had the chance to clinch a division title, but Michael Haynes for the pulled in two touchdown passes. Haynes, the game went into overtime. Morton Anderson missed a long one. Then Norm Johnson knocked this one through from 50 yards out as the Falcons won in overtime 23-20. In the playoffs, this was the game winner. Coming up right here, Chris Miller to Michael Haynes again. He gets by Milton Mack, goes 61 yards, and the Falcons eliminated the Saints 27 to 20. And as scary as it sounds, Haynes is off to a better start this season. In the loss to the Redskins, he pulled this 89-yard score in for his third touchdown of the young season. Alex, the Saints have opened up as a one-and-a-half-point underdog 
at Atlanta against the Falcons on Sunday. Obviously, in a 14 division, those six games in your own division are very, very important. And, you know, we bring it up every week, Ed, but after two of those first five murderous games, the Saints were in pretty good shape at 1-1. One and one. Now, The Falcons, 49ers, and the Lions are still to come, but the second half Sunday gives plenty of reasons to be optimistic. Want to be optimistic on Sunday? Don't kick it to Dion. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget to watch week number three of Friday Night Football, the area's most comprehensive look at prep action. That's Friday nights at 10.30, right here on WGNO 26. I'm Ed Daniels. I'm Alexandre Laurent. We'll see you next week on Saints Sideline.